Good morning. Um, actually, I'm very grateful for um, for Chad for the first talk. Uh, and I'm very happy that a lot of our students are here because we talked about, you talked about the major challenges that your generation is going to have. And now I'm going to bring it to reality. And what we are doing for many, many, many years and some thoughts about what we can do better. So, of course, we design for factor of safety and that is basically a ratio between uh, the capacity and the demand of a system. If that capacity is higher, then you are going to be safe depending on the range of uh, what you are building, what type of foundation. Um, when it comes to extreme events, and particularly earthquakes that I will be talking about, we still use factors of safety and it is the guidance of uh, codes. So what I will present is my personal opinion of where uh, we should be going. Um, and I'll start um, with a quote from um, Miller's book about what codes and practices should be doing. Uh, they should be a great guidance. They should give us some minimum requirements, but they should never constrain your innovation and imagination. So um, where are we now? This maybe you have seen it with your professors. Um, this is the example of Hardy's paradox with um, the three leg, um, uh, the three leg um, stool that takes a load of um, three. Uh, it has three legs, so it takes a load of, let's say, 60 keeps. I don't know why this is not playing right. Um, so I was trying to make a good point out of it. So. so the point is, I will describe it, is that do you think by adding one leg to this tool you would increase the factor of safety? Who says yes? It's a tricky question, right? You all know you, you shouldn't say yes. <laughs> So the reason why it is not as safe is because if, if the, the ground is a little giggly, the diagonal leg is not going to, um, to support you either. So all the load is going to go to only two legs. So more, it's not necessarily to be safer. Um, as we have seen, or we will see, in <laughs> In real life examples, uh, this is an example from uh, the 1995 Kobe earthquake in the Fukiai section of the Hanshin Expressway, uh, where there was a big factor of safety according to calculations. Um, so, uh, can we do better? And what does factor of safety really mean? Uh, I, I see it as a very deceiving word because it gives us a sense of security. But it doesn't say what's going to happen when you have extreme events, when you have climate, what's going to happen after a few years. So my example here is two, in terms of factor of safety, identical retaining walls uh, that retain the exact same type of soil, granular sand. One of them on your left is um, a conventional tangent pile wall. Um, they're both 10 meters high. The other one is an MSC wall, which is a mechanically stabilized earth wall. And um, they, phenomenically, they have the same factor of safety for static conditions, 1.8, the same factor of safety for seismic with a coefficient of acceleration of 0.16. So we put them to test analytically first. Uh, with two different earthquakes. A small earthquake, which is on the left, it's from the Loma Prieta 1989 earthquake, and on the right, uh, the Rinaldi record of the Northridge earthquake. And what you see on the left, on the smaller earthquake, the thicker, lighter line is the MSC wall. Uh, and what you are observing is the displacement um, at the top of the wall. So in the small 
uh, earthquake, both systems are going to survive. They have small displacements. They would be able even to be reused. On the other one, on the big one, which is what we would call the maximum considered earthquake in codes, the one that is an MSC displaces about 25, 30 centimeters, um, and probably it's gonna be okay. The other one is not going to be able to be used again. It's going to collapse. Codes do say that, that after an earthquake that is of that level, uh, your structure or your design is going to give you the chance to get out of it alive. But it doesn't say what's going to happen after. It does warn you that you might even have to demolish what you have made. So to me, life uh, safety is satisfied, but not necessarily life quality, which is what we want to look at in the future. So uh, we, we try to take it a little bit further and say, okay, this MSC wall has a reinforcement every 60 centimeters. Maybe we can save money and make it every uh, 1.2 meters, right? And we looked uh, numerically of how it behaves. And what we realized is that this is a very nice redundant system because it can shed the load within the reinforcement and also below the wall. Uh, but if you try to stretch it too much, it doesn't behave that well. So redundancy and robustness, which are key elements of a resilient system, were proven, and actually they were also proven through experiments. So what codes are saying, and they insist on that, is that when you design for extreme loads, and earthquakes particularly, your foundation needs to may remain elastic. Your foundation needs to have a bigger safety factor than the superstructure. So if something bad happens, the plastic hinge, the damage is going to be on the above ground structure. Uh, because the below ground is harder to, uh, to fix and for other reasons that I don't want to get into. So from an earthquake in Athens in 1999, you can see an example of exactly how this um, worked out, especially for a corner column. And in zoom, you can see this type of failure from big shear and bending moment. The reason for that is if you are trying to fix something to the ground, the nature is going to get at you. If you try to fix it, it's going to transfer huge loads above ground. And this is what the code say, but we have to think, right? So should we do better? Absolutely. Can we do better? Absolutely. Um, and I will show you how when this moves. Okay, so on the left, it's the conventional type of uh, philosophy with a large factor of safety, with the elastic, uh, this is just a, a, a peer example, with an elastic footing. What if uh, we, we go aggressively, and that's not my idea, that's ideas developed by Professor Cutter and Professor Gazetas for many, many, many years who they have been working on this. What if in the extreme events, you would allow for some uplift and some plastic hinging. What would happen then? You wouldn't have this fixity, right? You would relieve the superstructure from this tremendous load and maybe you would be able to save or at least allow functionality of that system. And we were able to uh, simulate that and also do um, uh, soil uh, box experiments. On the left, you see the fixed conventional system. On the right, you see the, um, I would say, yielding or rocking system. And you see that big stress is concentrated on the superstructure of the conventional system. So you have heard, I hope, yesterday especially, the, uh, the very interesting conversation about what the GI has developed on risk-based decision frameworks. And it's an effort that has started by uh, Professor Brio and uh, Professor Gilbert on developing such a framework. And I think moving forward with all these challenges we have, it's not going to be a safety factor that is gonna give us the big picture. It's going to be risk and reward solutions that are obviously going to cost different 
uh, in terms of money and they're going to give you different expectations. And this is something that you need to communicate to your clients and everybody involved so that they understand. They understand what this means. So um, in that case, the reward is going to be that you, you will have, uh, probably you will save lives, you will probably continue functionality. The downfall is that you will have uh, potentially something difficult to, uh, to fix, right? Uh, but it's repairable. And of course, I don't mean that we should do that for every static design that we do, allow uh, foundations to, uh, to rock and, and move. This has to be done very, very carefully. Um, and it's, we are a long way from getting there. Um, so, just to plant some seeds in, uh, in your minds about where we are going with codes and standards. There is a brand new standard, it's not a standard, it's a recommendation to the United States Congress about creating frameworks for functional recovery, particularly for our aged infrastructure system. It's an online report that you can download. It was submitted to Congress in February. It was developed by NIST and FEMA. And within this framework, we are introducing the concept of, in addition to life safety, a functional recovery, which is something that I feel that is easier to be understood by the broader audience, not just by engineers. As you all know, resiliency means probably a different thing to each one of us. But functional recovery is well understood, right? It's how long it's gonna take you to go back to school, how long your bridge is going to be closed. And in a sense, that goes beyond life safety and it goes to life quality. And it is very difficult, it is very interdisciplinary, but here is uh, the bonus that we have. Our projects are by its, their nature different. Our materials are very uncertain. There is an opportunity here for especially you, the younger generation of geotechnical engineers, to take leadership in paving the, the way in this new type of thinking in standards. And for us, the uh, more senior geoprofessionals is to look, at, to take a hard look at who are we working for? Are we working for a company, for an agency, or are we working for these people that are going to have their lives interrupted from these events? So there is an ethical obligation for us to think innovatively and we can do it. And lastly, in claiming um, a leadership, there is an issue of our profession and an issue of um, uh, avoiding to eventually have our work become a commodity. Because with the advanced machine learning, AI, factor of safety calculations are going to be done easier by maybe not humans. So with that, I hope um, that you will think and I'll be available to, to talk more if you'd like. Thank you.